Okay, so we're going to do a home inspection here on this house. And we're going to run through a bunch of photographs that I took during the inspection. And then we're going to look at the um, actual inspection report. We can read through it. Um, this is not a technical training session. Um, I want to give you the idea of, I've always thought it was really valuable to follow someone around and see how they did an inspection. So um, my inspection starts with the standards of practice and it's natcha.org SOP. And I use the standards of practice um, to guide my inspection, but also um, it is the absolute basic minimum of what you're required to do, right? It tells you what you're required to do and what you're not required to do. And it's kind of easy. The standards of practice is really easy. People make home inspection business, the home inspection process, a heck of a lot complicated uh, than it needs to be. Let's see. This is the most important part of the standards of practice. And you refer to the standards of practice in all of your legal documents. And it's um, here that I like. This is a really great clause. The home inspection is not going to reveal every problem that exists or will ever exist in the future. So that should relieve you of an incredible amount of burden. That, ha that house has a thousand defects. The house, of course, has a thousand defects. You're not required to find them all during an inspection. What are you required to do? You're required to reveal or, or report upon only those material defects that you observed on the date of the inspection. You're not required to find and report all the defects that are in the house. Only the ones that you observed and deemed material. And what does material mean? Material means it's going to hurt someone or it has a significant impact on the value of the house. A material defect is an issue with a system or component of a home that may have, may, a significant adverse impact on the value of the property or poses an unreasonable risk to people. That's all you're required to do. If you didn't see um, the double tap at the electrical panel, you, don't, you can't report upon it. This is a legal document that you could rely on to do a great inspection. And it's written by general counsel. So we have InterNACHI's general counsel to back you up. But it also allows you to um, understand what you're absolutely required to do. And, it's, and it also allows you to um, understand you're not required to find every defect in that house of horrors. There's a thousand of them. You're not required to find them all. You're only required to find the ones that you observed. You can't report on anything that you didn't see. And you deemed it to be material, which is hugely, like something's going to fall down. Like that deck, I would deem that to be a material defect, right? There's so many structural problems with that deck. It's, it collapses imminent. I love that word. It's going to happen. That deck is going to fall. So that is a material defect. I'm not sure if there are any other really material defects in the house of, of the house or horrors. That's kind of like the secret. It's really, no one's going to die. But someone's going to die on that deck eventually. Right? So that is a material defect, and I observed it. Now I'm required by the standards of practice to report upon it, because that's how it's defined. So everything else, every, every other defect in there, if you didn't observe it, and you didn't deem it material, you don't have to report upon it. Right? So that should, go, that should allow you to go, OK, I'm going to have fun now. Because this is the absolute basic minimum that you have to find, the material defects that you observe in deemed material. Everything else is going beyond the standards of practice. Every, that's the other secret is everyone is exceeding the standards of practice. They just don't know it. As soon as you identify um, a light bulb or something that doesn't work, you've exceeded the standards of practice because all you're required to do is report upon the observed defects that you deem to be material on the day of the inspection. Okay? So this is the absolute minimum that you have to do. If you saw that deck and inspected the deck and you didn't deem it to be material and you didn't say anything, that's, that's a huge issue, right? Someone could argue, oh, this deck is going to collapse. Now you have to defend you know, that. Or let's say 
you um, found something that's going to, that, let's just use the deck. That deck there, you thought it was going to be a serious problem. It's a material defect. You observed it and you didn't report upon it. You didn't put it in your inspection. Yep, that's like gross negligence, right? So if you find a material defect in the house and you observed it, right, you have a duty to your client to report upon it. All the other ones, you could argue that I actually didn't see the mold. I didn't see the uh, double tap. I didn't observe, it was hidden. You know, defects could be hidden. This defect was hidden during my inspection, right? Then the standards of practice is the absolute minimum. It's the foundation upon my, what my inspection, what I, what I do during the inspection. It reflects that. And it also reflects um, my report. So the first thing that I inspect, according to the standards of practice, just happens to be in this order, with the roof. I inspect the roof first. Why do I inspect a roof? Well, I like to get up on the roof before anybody else does, alone. I like to get there early and get up on the roof. But it's also the first thing within the standards of practice. It's the first thing that I inspect. It's the first thing that I report upon. The first section in my inspection report is roof. The first chapter in my home maintenance book that I give out is roof. Everything that I say is kind of like in that order. First I talk about the roof, then I talk about the exterior, then I talk about the basement and foundation, then we go heating and cooling. So it also could be used, the standards of practice could be used as, a, as a, a path, a guide through which you move through the home, and also a template that you use to use your inspection report, to build your report, to write your report, right? And it also has this co, um, cohesion, coherence, um, when someone is hiring you and you talk about the roof, they'll remember, oh yeah, the roof was first. And when they read the report, the first thing that comes up in the report is the roof in the, the home maintenance book, the first section. It's kind of like, uh, it, there isn't anything all jumbled up and mixed up, right? So you don't have to follow this path through the home, but I do. And we'll go, we'll see what happens when we do this inspection. And let's see if we can find a material defect. Or let's, let's see if I can find any defect because I often exceed the standards of practice. And this is one way I exceed the standards of practice. I get upon every roof. If I can, I'm walking on the roof. You're not required, upon, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface according to the standards of practice, right? But I do. I exceed the standards of practice, and I exceed it for all of my clients. I don't pick and choose. That's one of the uh, tips from our general counsel. If you exceed the standards of practice, make it something that you do um, always for all of your clients. Because one client, if they feel left out, um, like you gypped them, uh, they can have a complaint against you. I get on the roof for a couple of reasons. One, I feel like I can see more, you know, if I get up close. I've been trained, I built homes before I was an inspector. Um, I can get up on a roof pretty well. If it's kind of steep, 612, I kind of back off. I just go to the gutter's edge. Um, but every time I get up on a roof, uh, I see something that I probably wouldn't see if I didn't get up on a roof. And I take a lot of pictures. So I'm taking pictures. I take pictures of the ridge. I take pictures of every plane, every field. There's a hip, there's a ridge. I take pictures of every section. So this is in the front, here's the driveway. This is the front section, if I can see it. That's where I climbed up. Um, I didn't extend my ladder high enough, actually, but mm, it's gonna be about what you, are, um, what you feel safe in doing. So I totally, highly recommend not walking on the roof. Don't do it, it's not safe, but that's what I do. I exceed the standards of practice because I, then I use that to beat my, competition. So in my marketing, I tell all of my potential clients that I bring tall ladders. I bring a 28-foot fiberglass ladder, a 12-foot aluminum ladder. I even have a 40-foot aluminum ladder for barns. I, I beat my competition in various different ways by differentiating myself from my competition. I tell my clients, I, 
get up on the roof if I can, right? And it's okay to exceed. This is a quote from our general counsel. When in doubt about what the SOP requires in a particular situation, the inspector should err on the side of caution and exceed what the SOP requires. And you'll see that you tend to do that. You'll be reporting upon all of the defects that you observed, not just the ones that are material. And so I take close-up pictures too. I tend to take large pictures of a system and then I get up close and I take close-up shots of particular components and I can tell the weathering on this shingle. It's original to the house, this shingle roof. And that's kind of like a, a great shot for my inspection report. Like that is me with my finger touching the top of the roof. And when I put that in my inspection report, and my inspection report is passed around, um, people understand that I get up on the roof. Sometimes you just, you can't say it in words. You have to say it in pictures. Here's a torn shingle, no big deal. Um, rust on the cap, I'm not too concerned about that because of the age, but I will if I can reach it. I can't reach this one, it's too tall. But I, I will like to touch it. And actually in here, there tends to be a, a, a puddle of water. And I don't know why this is damaged, maybe when it was cleaned. And it's a stucco, hard coat stucco chimney. This is a wide chimney. If you have a, a wide chimney over 30 inches, you should have a cricket or a saddle so that the water diverts around the chimney. But I'm concerned that the stucco is touching the shingles. There's no clearance. And whenever I see a, a chimney, I look for kickouts, especially with stucco exterior siding material. There should be a kick out here, a piece of flashing. It's on the side of the House of Horrors. A piece of flashing that kicks out the water that's running around the chimney stack. And there's missing kick out flashing there. And there's a lot of open holes here. I'm trying to zoom my camera to get a good shot and it's a little difficult, but that's okay. There's missing kick out flashing right there. And the stucco is all the way to the shingles. There's no clearance and I can see mesh. That's a picture of mesh right there in that hole where this gutter ends. There's a hole in the stucco and that's gonna be an awesome, awesome defect that I'm gonna report upon. There it is, there's the mesh. Right now I feel really good during my inspection. I feel like I could almost leave, right? I'll spend a couple more minutes in the house but that is a problem because this house is 20 years old and no kick out flashing, 20 years of water going down this chimney. The chimney structure is built out of wood and probably particle board. And that area there, if we had a stucco probe with moisture, it's gonna be all rotten. Can't believe that thing is standing. So there it is. That's a good shot too, if your feet are on something. I like to take sh pictures of my feet and then stick them in the report. Why? This, this doesn't tell me anything about the condition of the roof. I'm doing it for marketing purposes. A lot of the things that I do during inspection, I'm thinking, is this a good business decision or a marketing um, move? And that there, being in my inspection report, is a good marketing play there because my home inspection report is the greatest marketing piece of my business. We can have InterNACHI marketing team design a great business card, flyer, brochure, but nothing beats your inspection report, what you actually are hired to produce. That inspection report should be the best thing you do. You should work on it every night. Every sentence should be reviewed. While you're inspecting and sentence isn't written quite well, if you could edit it with your software right then and there, do it. Or do that editing at night. Always constantly improve the way your report reads and looks. Be easy to read, clear to understand, lots of pictures, maybe a video embed, Home Gauge, Home Inspector Pro, those are my favorites, either one. Uh, a little concerned about the, um, the flashing. Um, around a boot, I don't like this to be deteriorated or this rusted, and especially no exposed roofing nails. So the roofer um, could have tucked the nail underneath the shingle, but didn't, just drove it right in there. And any exposed roofing nail, just about on any, uh, any roof material, I can't think of any others, um, that's a water entry point. I call them water entry points. 
lots of pictures. So I go up on the roof, I get there early. I like to get there like mm, uh, 20 minutes early at least. And uh, no one comes on the roof with me. And um, I don't need the homeowner to open the front door. So I'm there alone. And I'm trying to time it actually so that I'm done with the roof inspection and all my photos and writing my report with my mobile device. And I'm getting ready to come down and my client hopefully is just like pulling into the driveway and I can wave to them. Those are great moments when you're doing an inspection because you wave to your client 30 feet down and they're looking up and they're realizing that's my home inspector and I hired the right inspector, right? But you don't have to walk upon any roof surface. But honestly, if you're in my neighborhood, um, why would anybody hire you? So you have to figure out how to beat me. If I'm walking on the roof, you have to figure out something else that's gonna beat me in the market. We're friendly competitors, I'll see you in the chapter meeting, I'll buy your coffee. But in, in business, it's kind of like that, right? You have to get that job. Now, to get the job, I have to d distinguish myself from all the rest. And this one thing that I do, all of my inspectors did, really distinguished us from all the rest. You know, I know inspectors that will drive up in a Prius. That's okay if you have a Prius, that's all right. All I'm saying is when I drive up with two vans and ladder racks and ladders and we're all up on the roof, um, that's uh, a dominant marketing position. So think how you can beat me. Maybe you can beat me with infrared. Maybe I don't have infrared. Maybe you can beat me with infrared, right? So when I get up on the roof, I'm always surprised. I, I would never have seen this if I stayed on the ground. So maybe a spectroscope where you can actually see closely the roof condition while standing safely on the ground. I don't like drones. Uh, they won't work in Colorado. You can give it a try. Um, FAA re uh, regulates it, requires certification. You have to be kind of like a pilot of an unmanned drone uh, vehicle. There's a test. There's some classes. but. Um, in Colorado, a gust of wind happens like that, and it'll be 30 miles an hour, and, and then it'll go away. And my drone will be in someone's neighborhood. Um, so I like to be up right up close. Yeah, so those are just roofing nails that have either popped out or just like that boot flashing was installed on top. Like they gunned it. Um, they were out of control. And there were scuff marks and damage marks. That's not hail. That's like a scuff mark there. That's physical damage. That's like a physical, that's a hole. And there's a roofing nail, a roofing nail. So, you know, I used to carry um, two, back then, I'd probably use my iPhone now. I don't do inspections anymore. I used to have a, um, I think it was called a framer's pouch, where you have two pouches for your nails. The left was my um, video camera, and the right was my picture camera. So I took a lot of pictures, Step, 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 step. And then I used to shoot video. And so with my picture camera, you go micro setting and you take a really nice shot like that. And that's gonna end up in my inspection report. And there's the gutters. They're good shape. Pretty good. No problems. So as I come down my ladder, I get to look at other things. As I'm stepping down, now I'm down. And there's my money shot. So why do I take a picture of my ladder? Because I remember I gotta beat you. You're really good. Because you've got the look. I may not, I'm growing the look. You've got the look that's gonna beat you. You're gonna have trouble, because you're the young guy. This guy here just looks like he knows what he's doing. What's your name? Richard. Richard, I, I hire him in a heartbeat if compared to you. So you young guys with the really good looking faces, you have to beat Richard because he ha he's, got, he's got you beat just by his looks, right? So maybe I could beat Richard with this. Maybe Richard doesn't go up on a roof, so I'm gonna put that on my website, that I climb roofs. I'm gonna beat uh, someone else. Anyone else shoot video or think about shooting video during an inspection? So <coughs> I used to shoot video during my inspection and only really the roof. Yeah, on the roof. Is original to the house. Um, start budgeting for a new roof. I don't think it needs to be replaced now, but um, there are signs of its old age. So maybe in five years, you may start to see some shingles that need to be replaced. They may tend to curl or crack. So start 
close monitoring is needed and budgeting. Um, indication of this old age is the edges of the shingles have worn out and so we get to see the fiberglass mat of the shingles themselves. There's some roofing nails popping through the shingles and these are holes and water entry points so they need to be repaired. And um, the granular surface is starting to erode away at the edges. And these are all indications of older age. You're not required to estimate the roof age. Appear to be functional. The stucco on the exterior chimney stack appears to be okay. There's some surface rust developing on the top chimney stack that could be scraped and painted. There aren't any kick out flashings around the sides of the gutters. Those kick out flashings are required and need to be installed. Any, anything that I can find that allows me to recommend a professional to further evaluate the system or component is great for me, right? Allows me to divert that responsibility to someone else. I found a lot of problems on the roof. A roofer's got to go up there, for sure. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is the software. Remember, you can use the SOP as a template for your software report? Well, I'll use the mobile device. For years, half of my career, I used um, a laptop or a desktop, right? It took forever. I would do my, all my work during the day, and then I'd come home at night, fool around with the kids, little ones, and then start my day, so I'm going to start my evening, and writing all my inspection reports. Screw that. Go mobile. That's how you do two a day, five days a week, six days a week, and do it quickly and have free time at night. So when I'm on the roof, I have my mobile device, and I used to use um, Porter Valley. Uh, they're still around. Um, and I would uh, do my checks. I, I'd click. It's simply, uh, simply uh, checking the sentences that I want in the report. So easy. Click, 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 click. Some default stuff, some customized stuff, so I have to type while I'm up there. And then take my pictures, and then before I put my foot on the ladder, I'm essentially done with that system. I'm done inspecting it, I'm done taking pictures of it, and I'm done writing it. And at the very end of the inspection, I'll be completely done with the report, and I click a summary report, and I print it out or email it. And I'm done. I go to my next job, and I'll finish that, and then I'm home for dinner, and I got my evenings to goof around and think about marketing and how to beat Rich Richard in the marketplace. Uh, I follow water, the path of water. So I'm, I inspect the roof, and I think about water. This is Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, um, <coughs> cold climate, a lot of rain. And I think about water coming down. I want the downspouts to go into something. Underground drainage pipes, not required to inspect them, but I want to make sure that I'm looking for any kind of maybe backflow, that'd be cool, some erosion or something. I can't get to all the roof sections, and I don't have to move my ladder all around. So I can inspect it from the ground over here, and then I see a window up there so I can climb out if I wanted to, or inspect that roof section with the skylights from that vantage point. So I'm saving my time. A lot of inspectors think that they actually have to then touch the thing that they're inspecting. You really don't. You only have three hours. I used to schedule my inspections at 8 o'clock and at noon. I would leave the house at 7, 7.30, get to 8, maybe early, finish up in a couple hours, two, two and a half hours, go to my next one, plenty of time, finish up late afternoon. And I'm taking pictures of that defect. So I have to remember what I saw above on the roof, and here's perfect. This is just a great sign of a missing kickout flashing that's allowing water to stream down the side of the chimney stack. And there's the other side, there's the left side. So I know if I've got that on the outside, that's an indication of a defect in the inside. So I'm gonna describe that as much as I can. So General Counsel, Internet General Counsel, um, provides a lot of tips on how to say things in your inspection report. So there's a URL, there's a, a really nice article about the word visible and the word evidence. So one of the things is an inspector's duty isn't to report on everything visible, but rather only those defects 
that you observe and deem to be material. Remember that. You're not required to report upon all of the thousands of defects in the house of horrors. Only the ones that you observe and deem to be material. I did not observe any indications of uh, missing shingles during my home inspection, and I didn't. That's the way you write an observation in narrative format. That's a sentence that legal counsel recommends, right? I did not observe any indications of. Some people write, um, there was no visible evidence of something. That sentence is gonna get you in trouble. Don't say there was no visible evidence. One, somebody could argue in court that it was visible, and how are you gonna counter that argument? It probably was visible, right? So you don't want to say no visible evidence. And you don't want to use the word evidence because that, con that conveys that um, evidence um, is kind of permanent and it always stays. If, it was, if, if someone finds evidence here, it, was, it probably existed back then when you did the inspection, right? So evidence is kind of like a permanent thing. And we know as home inspectors, nothing's permanent. The house changes almost immediately after I leave the house. Anything can happen after I leave the house, right? Conditions change. So you don't want to use the word evidence. You want to say, I did not observe any indications of, and you insert your defect. Or I observed indications of roofing nails popping through the shingles during my home inspection. And then you get to report upon defects. Any defect. But you get to report upon it that doesn't get you in trouble, right? So here's the rest of the exterior. So a general counsel, Mark Cohen, I hope you get to meet him if you haven't yet. He wrote this um, agreement system that we have for all members to use. And he wrote one version of the agreement in plain English. And this comes from the plain English version. So he highly recommends all contracts to be written in plain English. And this is a reflection of plain English. Instead of being uh, convoluted or a little uh, hidden with your intentions or communications or you know, you're trying to um, divert things away and not really be specific, he thinks it's okay to use plain language, plain English, I didn't see that or I saw this during my inspection. So those are the sentences, sentences that he recommends. The, the no visible evidence is a legal term really, there were no visible evidence of blood stains on the carpet, you know, during the murder. You know, it's, it, you don't want to get into that. Plain English is what Mark Cohen really loves and highly recommends and will defend to the death. <laughs> uh, I'm doing the exterior now. So the exterior is the second section of the standards of practice. It's the second section that I inspect. It's the second thing that I talk about during my uh, inspection to my client. It's the second thing that I report upon in my inspection report. It's the second thing that appears in the home maintenance book. Oh, it's, it's also the second, um, we have sections in the newsletter too. So there's a customized newsletter go, that goes out. So it's like, wow, that, I remember that flow. That inspector took me around the outside and then we went on the inside and this is the inspection report. So I don't like the exterior siding being so close, even though it's vinyl. I'm assuming behind this vinyl, maybe six inches up where it's fastened, is wood, right? So I don't like how close it is. I think it was lower, and then they installed this brick patio up against the bottom of the siding and even covering it. And for some reason right there, it's bulging. Now, if you take a look at how vinyl siding is installed, you'll see that on our house, uh, horrors, um, there's, there's um, sheathing plywood sheathing under here. It could be OSB, it could be um, plywood, it could be particle board, but it's swelled on this house. Something's pushing out. I don't have to diagnose it. Is, is diagnose, the word diagnose in the standards of practice? Nothing under the required sections. I'm not required to diagnose any problems. So I'm gonna report upon this defect that I observed during the inspection. I observed indications of bulging um, I like that shot. Richard, you're in trouble, man. I'm gonna put that on my homepage. Uh, and I report upon all the different materials. And as I go around, oh, I probably took mm, 75 pictures of the roof. I'm gonna take another 50 of the exterior. And when I come down, uh, my client is there, remember, I get down, I'm done writing the roof 
report. I shake my client's hand, big smile, lots of cards, not just one, lots of cards. And I tell them about the condition of the roof. I say it with a smile. I don't care if there's a big hole in the roof. I can say it with a smile because they have fallen in love with the house. There's hardly anything that you could say that's gonna kill this deal. We're, we're, we're thought of ki deal killers. I mean, that must have happened once in the past. It must have been a terrible house or something, and that term just has stuck with us. But really, in all the years, 13 years of doing inspections, I don't think I've ever said anything. I've, I've found some nasty stuff that could change um, someone's love for their dream home, right? So it doesn't matter what I say almost. So I, I shake the hand, I tell them about the condition of the roof, kick off flashing, roofing nails, uh, erosion, all that good stuff. And then I ask them if they wanna go around the house with me. Would you like to go around the exterior? Let's go. And I'll walk, I have no idea wh what's coming up. But I'm gonna do a quick exterior, I do it all in the same uh, counterclockwise always. I go to the right and I take my client around, we go around the house, and I'm not really taking pictures or testing things. It's really like I'm taking them around and I'm showing things. Hopefully there's something obvious that I can comment upon. The idea is to give them a good idea of what's going on in the exterior and get them inside so that I can inspect. I want them off of me, go measure something now, go inside, take a look at the bathrooms or something, think about your remodeling, the curtains or something, take some measurements. I'll be inside. And then I pull out my tools and I'm going around the exterior and I'm inspecting the heck out of it. And I may go once or twice because there are so many systems and so many nooks and crannies on the exterior. It's kind of difficult. This is loose flashing, loose capping here. It blew off. The nail popped off. I don't know what's going on. And I don't do the home gauge, home inspector pro, all those software things where you can draw arrows and circles and different colors and shad. Uh, I just use my finger. I don't have time to write, draw an arrow after I'm doing this. There's no time for that. So I just point. Use your finger, you know? So I never, I never use circles and arrows and things in my inspection report. You can't store wood up against the house. I don't care if it's concrete right there. Um, it's just a termite. Uh, invitation to termites, uh, wood destroying insects, carbonary ants. Um, when I take a look at a, um, a hole through the exterior wall, I call it, all doors and windows, pipes, um, any kind of penetration through the wall. I go um, bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left, bottom left, bottom right. It's kind of like a clock, uh, counterclockwise, right? The way I inspect the exterior is the way I inspect a hole. I go like this. So bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left. And that's where all the fun is. This is a lot of fun. This is like capping that I like to get underneath with my fingers and pull off. And if I can get underneath and find wood rot, ah, that makes my day. Or tap it along the sides. Just tap with a screwdriver. One time a lady complained that uh, my screwdriver went through her window. Well, it was completely rotten. And I tend to leave my screwdriver in the rotten component and take a picture of it, right, to show that it's stuck in wood rot. But, um, you know, I explained that you know, you should be patting me on the back for finding wood rot on your windowsill instead of complaining that my screwdriver is stuck in wood rot. Uh, window wells. This one is uh, damaged. It's not really doing a great job. It has vegetation inside. It should be nice and clean and dry. Um, it's filled up with leaves and vegetation. And it's damaged. So, like, I wouldn't take a picture of the window well with an arrow saying damage. It takes five minutes to do that. I don't have that kind of time. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna grab the thing. I love it when I find damage. I love it when I damage something too. That's your job. I love the soft brass P-traps, right? With this, with the, it's a really wonderful after about 10 years, it just disintegrates in your hand. So I love filling up the sink, filling up that P-trap and just squeezing the P-traps. If I can squeeze a P-trap and it explodes in my hand, I take a picture and I report upon it. It's really great, that's your job. If you open and close the garage door and it pops off the rail, somebody should be patting you on the back because you found that problem before someone else did. That's your job. And I always report, I never hold back. If I, find, if I break something, I always take a picture of it and I said, now there, I did break like someone's personal property. Like I bumped, I, I felt it was like um, uh, a booby trap. Right? It was like these porcelain baby feet 
right? Um, above a wooden um, potbelly stove, right? And I wanted to see behind the potbelly stove just to see in my head caught that. I don't know what the baby feet are doing by the potbelly stove. I didn't even think about it. And they smashed and we had a terrible time with that, but I paid for that. I didn't take a picture of the broken baby feet. I don't know what that is, but there's just junk. Uh, exterior, so you're required to um, inspect a lot of things on the exterior. There's a lot, there's a huge list. One of them is driveways. So I walk the driveway and I walk up to where the driveway goes, which is the garage door. And that's uh, an improvement is recommended. I call it um, a minor defect that could be patched up. No big deal. Little grass, a lot of cracking. If I see Major cracking like this. Um, my father-in-law used to seal coat driveways, so I'm gonna pick that out. And I'm just gonna say it's old condition. I'm not gonna say you're, you need a new driveway. And retaining walls, that's required by the standards of practice. Um, and I know this, I don't have to remember the standards of practice because it's part of my software template, right? It basically reflects the, it tells me what I'm supposed to uh, inspect in my software checklist, my mobile device looks just like the standards of practice. I'm required to inspect that, inspect that, inspect that. So when I get to retaining wall, it's in the standards of practice. And so I find the retaining walls and I found a missing piece. And lots of pictures. So there's, that was 10 pictures of the retaining wall, right? I don't put all of them in the report. I may put one, right? I'll probably have this one, I forget actually. I'll probably have that one in the report or something like that in the report. And then I actually give all of my photos to my client on a USB. And the video too, I download it. Boop. The video is really cool. I play it for my client when I'm done with the inspection and I'm in the kitchen trying to compile my documents and my report and finish up and trying to get paid. And I, um, I get ready to play the video and I turn my computer around and I hit play and I ask my client to watch the video and their real estate agent, I gotta get the real estate agent involved too because this is a marketing opportunity. And they're watching the video of me up on the roof. Remember the video of me up on the roof? And it, it takes a few minutes before they go, that's my roof. And I say, yeah, that's what I was doing up on the roof. You know, now they're like, this guy's really good. I'm glad we hired them. And they'll nudge their real estate agent, thanks for recommending Big Ben inspections, you know? So it, it helps you perform an inspection taking lots of pictures, it forces you to look at things. The uh, video recording forces you to speak well while you're um, doing your inspection, and it's a marketing, it's amazing. So I'm gonna beat whoever doesn't do video. Um, I do video in all of my inspections. Here's a compressor unit. Could be an air conditioner, could be a heat pump, not sure. Looks relatively new. Um, I'm not required, right, to, uh, no one is, no home inspector is required to comment upon the size, the BTU, uh, the age, nothing. But I do have data. And if you wanted to go a little further beyond the standards of practice for every client, you could. So using the serial number, I could tell you exactly when this unit was um, made, manufactured. And there's a pattern to serial numbers and model numbers. And this one, for this model uh, carrier, it's uh, four digits a letter, five digits, four digits, a letter, five digits. And I can use this website, and I should call them up. I don't even know who they are, but they have a great website. Yeah. Uh, condensate line, so um, I know this is an air conditioner or a heat pump, and there's a condensate pump near the evaporator coil, interior air handler unit, and it's pumping out the condensate. I like a clear tube, I don't want dirt, and I want it discharging, the most important part is discharging really far away from the house. This one wasn't. So I just want that water discharging away from the house as much as the downspouts. This could discharge gallons of water in a very humid summer day. Gallons of water dumping right next to the unit. I don't want that. Disconnect needs to be in sight. Uh, take a peek at the refrigerant lines. Um, the, what's the large diameter line coming from a heat pump, what's it called in general terms? Huh? Yep, yeah, but there's another one I like. Suction line, yeah. And the other one's called a what line? Liquid line. 
So a suction line is dot large diameter, liquid line is small diameter. Which one's insulated? Large. Yeah, yep. That's about all you need to know to be a happy home inspector and um, go on vacation and own a home. Um, we're training you in this class a lot of information. There's a lot of information, technical information online. But when you are doing an inspection you, and you're following the standards of practice and you're backed up by legal documents, you really get to have a lot of fun. It's the most fun job I've ever had. And I've had some, I'm a relatively young guy, I've, I've been in sewers, ditches, and I've done disgusting things. Um, and being a home inspector is like the best because you get to be an expert in your own little world, you know? And you get to help people that really need your advice, your opinion. You're only expressing advice and opinion. You're not an expert, don't call yourself an expert, and you're not even measuring anything. You don't have to quantify anything. It's really just, um, you're looking for problems, anomalies, and um, giving your opinion. So, so much fun. Uh, so I'm looking at components of the exterior system, and I'm looking at anything. I mean, I'll take a picture of anything. I mean, look, I don't even know what I'm, I don't know, I'm just taking a picture. Uh, the backyard, maybe I'm looking for a pool, I don't know. But I'm, I just want to take a picture. If I could take a, a, a million pictures, I would, you know, and then somehow compile them all and pick what I want out of it. So I was snapping away. I've been snapping away, snapping away. Hairline foundation, foundation and crack, uh, poor concrete foundation, pretty typical to see. Um, hairline, I don't want anything that I can stick a quarter in on edge. I don't want displacement or movement or separation. Now this um, meter had an underground line coming up and it's attached to the bottom of the meter. The dirt around the house settled and pulled the meter down away from the siding and there's just a ton of silicone in there. So they're pumping silicone in there. But what I like to do is, that's a great indication of the screws now are probably like pulled away. Maybe they're sheared off. I like to grab that meter with my hand and see if I can pull it off the house. <laughs> I love it. I've done that before. And it's really great because it's nasty behind there. It's all rotten. It's so much fun to pull a meter off the house. Um, and then the electric line that goes into the electrical panel in the basement. And the line looks good. The conduit coming up looks good. There's the grounding wire to the grounding rod. The acorn clamp is on the right side. That's good. Uh, cable, phone, water meter on the outside. Uh, phone, there's the, there's the goop. Um, it's unreliable. That's why I like to use. It's unreliable. It should be flashing or tight. So, uh, an inch and a half of silicone isn't going to cut it. Yep, so um, I'll try to find, like, um, I'll, I'll plug the sink with the stopper and make a little note, handwritten note. Um, I'll, I'll try to warn the seller of problems that I found that may surprise them, right? But I'm not gonna disclose anything to them. I only wanna uh, disclose things that I have uh, found that are broken, maybe by my hand or not, and that would surprise them. So I don't want them to run water or flush the toilet if I know that toilet is. One time I had um, a panel, uh, I, you know, I exceed the standards of price, so I pulled the dead front cover off the panel. You don't have to, you don't have to. If you don't want to, don't. I did, and I, I, remember, I still remember, I, I was um, in the laundry room, and I looked on the other side of the panel, and it was scorched like crazy. And I was like, what the heck is that from? It, was like, it looked like it just got hit by lightning. And I looked, and there were these two big, large wires coming out, and they were taped. And I thought, oh, those two wires touched this, and now I'm touching it, you know? I can't put this back on. So I had this serious problem. I called an electrician. I didn't leave that laundry. I was on the phone. I can't, uh, I can't leave an open dead panel. I don't know if a kid's gonna come in. I don't know, you know, it's an occupied house. So I had to stay there until the seller was notified and there was an electrician on the way and the real estate agent stayed there because I had to leave the dead front cover off a live electrical panel. You know, if you, if you see hazards like that that's gonna hurt someone, you gotta tell them. But I'm not gonna, tell them that the ground fault is, that's, that's my client's thing, you know. Did I answer your question? Like serious things that are gonna hurt the seller, I'm gonna tell them about. From a litigation, from a litigation standpoint, like you have destroyed the P-trap, yeah. you ripped the, um... <laughs> the meter off the house? Yeah. Yep. 
You know, I've never, I've never had any problems with that. The only things that I've ever had problems was with um, like damaging someone's personal property. Like I tripped the GFCI um, and I didn't reset it like an idiot. And the cooler of wine went warm. And I, hours later, I came to the garage and I bought, I bought all the wine. You know, that's what they complain about, you know. That, for me, that's my experience. No one ever said, hey, you pulled the electrical meter off of the house, you know. I would have easily explained that away. Like, that was the condition that I revealed for my client. When you left that house, pardon me, did you leave it without power? That house no, it was live. It was a live electrical panel. That's why I was so no, nervous about it. About the meter? Yeah, no, the, it's still, it's, it's just the attachment. So if you ever pull, up, if you ever pull, they use uh, wood screws, like yeah, four wood screws. Box yeah. The meter box. I call it the meter box. Yep. Off the wall, yeah, just the attachment, yeah, to it. So it was just four screws, you know. So I've never, I was just full gung ho. Just love to, because uh, to tell you the truth, like after 10 years, it gets a little boring, right? So you're just, you're just dying for something exciting in a home, because you've seen just about everything. You've seen this before so many times. You know exactly what to say, and you've seen this before. And you're just waiting for a hole in something, a leak of some kind of dangerous or something, you know, it's just, it's great. And no one has ever complained. I don't have, I don't have any, the, uh, I've been sued, uh, I was sued, I'm no longer an inspector, so I was sued over um, not finding um, pet urine in carpet padding, right? So that's easy, I, I won the case in five minutes in front of the judge with the standards of practice, boom. And um, what, I was, uh, the second one, I was sued for a second one. I can't remember what it was for. And then I've been called as an expert witness. You know, it's kind of fun, you know, when you break things. So, you know, I was doing an inspection, and um, they hired me to come back because I was able to explain how rainwater leaked into a living room with um, new wood floor and damaged all the wood. And I forced water through a slider door. I f I've made it leak. That was a lot of fun. And I videotaped the whole thing. So, you know, it's kind of fun to damage a house, to find problems that really shouldn't exist, you know? So you gotta, I like to pull on things, you know? I like to shake that railing. It's supposed to be 250 pounds in any direction. Guess how much I weigh? 240 pounds. It's supposed to be 250. And then there's 50 pounds on the guard, right? 50 pounds per square foot on the guard. So, yeah, give it a, you know, grab it. Grab that railing. If you grab that railing, that's really, that's a defect, right? So I like to grab things and pull things. That's why my hand is in a lot of pictures, you know, left and right. I'm doing something with my left and I'm taking a picture of it. I don't know. That's the fun part of doing a home inspection. Don't, don't be too serious. You know, have fun, you know? Fun, the funnest part, one of the funnest days was when the garage door totally popped off. Boom, 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 boom. I was in the kitchen and my other partner was in the garage. He's like, and there's panels like this. There's, they just all pa fell apart. And I said, wow, this is great. This is amazing. Can you imagine if a Porsche was under there? Yeah? We found this. You know? I'm always like turning my back, waiting for somebody to pat me. Good job. Found the defect. I'm serious. Like, I have fun. You know? Is that a good question? Uh, answer? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, this is, I'm all about my instructors. We're all about, it's all about knowledge, conveying knowledge to you, right? And I'm the other way. I want you to have fun, you know? Because I had so much fun. So here's a, here's a defect. I don't know what happened. It just chipped. I didn't actually chip this, right? I didn't cause the chip. It was chipped. But that's wood rot now. So that's kind of fun. I want to expose it and take a picture of it. And it's right there, you know? So a lot of things like this also show, I don't put this in the report, but it, show, it will allow me to explain that I can't see everything. There's dense vegetation surrounding the exterior of the house, so I can't see anything. This is proof. If I had to write this, this is difficult to write, but a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is awesome to show my um, restrictions. So here I am. The front door is always really fun. So I see different color different color, what's this different color, like they're patching or something? I think this settled, and this is in contact with the siding here, and I wanna go bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left, and 
that's what I do. So, mm, that's fun there. So inside, a, system, a house is a system of interdependent parts. One part affects another. So inside in the basement, I know this is a basement because remember the window wells? In, in the basement, I want to find this area and see if it has water damage on the inside, right? Because I see there's, what did they do? They, they took this J channel and cut it and it, I don't know, and they squished it with the concrete down there. That's awesome. That's really messed up. Look at, look at the, how warped that bottom of the siding is. They just pushed concrete in there. Really strange. Gray silicone at the bottom here. Oh, this is a great place for wood rot. And there I am. I'm looking for wood rot. And it looks all messed up and swelled and painted over a million times. This is exciting. I can't wait to get into the basement and look above my head for this area. And right here at the tread, looks like the front door settled, right? Like that, and pulled away from the, the wood floor. This is all really good observed indications of something. Can't wait. Oh, so you can't have any, this is a dryer exhaust, you can't have any um, screen or grate on the exhaust. It has to be an open dryer exhaust with a hood and a damper. Is that a local thing? No, that's an IRC, dryer exhaust. We have really good articles, slash articles, nadgy.org slash articles, and you can read about the dryer exhaust, the kitchen exhaust, the bathroom exhaust. Um, so, yeah, all dryers, there's, you know, certain num a certain number of feet in length it can only be, a maximum, although they keep um, extending that length because our McMansions get, get, keep getting bigger and the builders don't know where to put that dryer or bathroom exhaust. And now they're allowing a fan to be installed in the middle of the dryer exhaust because the exhaust is 50 feet. You know, it used to be 25, now it's 35. Now it can be 55, 50 with a fan. It's ridiculous. So I like doors, love doors, and touching it and pushing on it. And I do the same thing with um, walls. I do the same thing with tile in the bathroom. This is, you know, I just love touching and pushing things. So it's a heat pump because I don't see any fuel. I don't see any oil, I don't see natural gas, I don't see any propane. I don't see a flue pipe coming from you know, a burner or a heat exchanger. So this is, a, this is a heat pump. It has a humidifier. There's the screen. Hopefully an air filter. Looks like there was some maybe cleaning of the duct. And or maybe a probe to test the temperature. And it looks like a newer hot water tank. It's not gas or fuel fired, it's electric. So this is an electric house. I didn't see a gas meter on the outside. I didn't see a buried oil tank. I didn't see a propane tank. So I have to think, like, while you're doing the exterior, yeah, uh, I didn't see any tanks on the outside. While I was on the roof, I didn't see any chimneys. Did you see any chimneys? I didn't see any. I saw a fireplace chimney, so I know I have a fireplace. Maybe it's masonry on the inside. Or I think it's factory built. And there's the air conditioner lines, refrigerant lines, condensate line. There's a carrier. So we could look up this serial number. What's different with this serial number? It's a different year. It's off by four years. Uh, off by four years, yeah. 2003? 90? No, it's off by 14 years. So the interior evaporator coil is different from the exterior unit. I want somebody to come in, just based upon that. Or I want the seller, I have it in a report, I want the seller to disclose, I'm looking for R22. Um, it's old um, refrigerant gas too. Oh, there it is. So um, this uh, kills the ozone, um, unless the EPA says it doesn't anymore. Um, there's two lines for the uh, um, power to the unit and also uh, electric backup. Condensate, I love putting my hand on the condensate because sometimes these pipes pop. Even though the, I see the glue, the, cle um, the cleaning and the, the, the glue, the adhesive, sometimes they just pop right off. And then there's the condensate pump. I want it to pump outside, GFCI protection. Air filter, brand new, just for me, thanks. I'm sure the old one was just nasty because I took a look on the inside, I stuck my camera either 
I don't, sometimes I, um, oh, I didn't bring my screwdriver. My favorite screwdriver has uh, like six different things, Phillips head, flat head, and then if you pull the, the, the Phillips head out, it becomes a socket, you know? And so I, I pull the front cover off of the evaporator coil just enough to look inside with my flashlight and take a picture of the coil. The fins here are just um, black and dirty and nasty. So no one has cleaned this for a long time. So it's running totally inefficiently and it's leaking here. There was water below at the bottom where the air filter is and it was wet there. So this is like leaking. And um, so this old interior coil, which is 14 years older than the compressor on the outside, um, needs help. And I don't know what that is. I don't care. It's unplugged. I note it in the report. Here's the um, humidifier and a little duct damper, a little control. No big deal. I always take a picture of the last time the unit was serviced. And if it hasn't been within 12 months, it's in my report as a recommendation. Every year, every HVAC unit should be inspected and serviced. I don't care where I am every year. And that allows me to get someone to further evaluate the entire system that I just inspected. It relieves my burden of taking all that responsibility. It looks complicated, but everything looks pretty good. Toilet flange, cold water supply, drain pipes. So now, oh, uh, remember I kicked my clients in the ex to the house so I can do the exterior. Now I'm going inside the house. I may grab my clients and take them with me throughout the rest of the inspection because I realized I'm a lot better in my time if I have my clients behind my shoulders and I'm inspecting and I'm talking and I'm taking pictures and I can do it all at the same time. Sometimes you just don't want to do that. Like my new inspectors, they wanted to be alone for a while with the furnace, you know, and inspecting it and the, the water and the hot water tank, you know, alone. And then they're ready to talk and that's fine. When your new inspectors, because you're going to grow your business and hire new inspectors, when your new inspectors get like a few under their belt, they'll want, or you should, want your clients to walk with you. Because I've got another job to do and I can do everything at the same time after a while, even do my inspections. So I did the furnace, which is the most exciting part for a new buyer. Where's the heat and cooling come from? Where's the air filter? Where's the thermostat? And then I do um, drain waste and then water coming in and hot water source. And then we go to the electrical. So right now I'm doing drain waste, looking for clean outs, looking for anything that's leaking, anything nasty. There's the um, main line going through the foundation wall in the front. Now water coming in. This is public water. It's not private well. Water shutoff valve, ball valve. Um, if it has an arrow, I may take some time to see that the arrow is pointing in the right direction. A lot of ball valves don't. Uh, this is a check valve. That's the water meter with the sensor on the outside. Remember that black box? Another valve. Uh, pressure regulator and check valve. Pressure regulator and check valve. So now it's a closed system. Water comes in, pressure regulated, um, checked, and it's, it's all in there. It can't back in, backflow into the public system. And that's important because somewhere in this house there's a hot water tank heating water. And when you heat water, water expands. And it can't expand backwards because it has a check valve. So what happens? Well, you need an expansion tank. So there's a jumper. There's a jumper. Oh, sorry, wrong way. Um, another shutoff. So there's a hot water source, electric hot water source, electric line. Sometimes I pull this cover off, sometimes I don't. I want to make sure that the wiring is good. I'm not required to. Um, size of the tank is 80 gallons. Date, somebody did that for me. Cold water coming in. TPR valve extended to the floor. It doesn't have a catch pan. This is an unused, um, unfinished basement, but I like a catch pan anyways. And it's my prerogative to recommend catch pans wherever I think they should be. So I always recommend a catch pan underneath any hot water tank. I don't care where it's located. Um, there's the expansion tank. So when the hot water tank heats up water, there's pressure. That's why there's a pressure temperature relief valve. If it exceeds, that discharges, but it can't go backwards through that check valve. So you need to expand, allow for expansion. Now I'm at the electrical. 
and it's in the basement. And back then, this was, arc faults were new, right? So we, I had one arc fault, woo, in this house, right? Now they're required all over. And usually when, um, I'm t oh, 200 amps. If it was 100, it'd be one finger. 150 is bent, 200, 200 amp, main electrical um, disconnect. Um, so I inspect according to, um, I inspect regardless of the age of the house. I ins if arc faults are required in the bathrooms, dens, you know, all those other places that they're required nowadays, um, I'm going to recommend it. I inspect regardless of age. I inspect according to the most recent, safest building practices, which is code. Now, you may be from a state that regulates home inspectors and you can't say the word code, like Texas. They'll put you in jail if you say the word code because you're not a code inspector. But I, stay, I say um, modern building standards, practices, um, safety standards. And so if I was inspecting this home tomorrow, I would recommend an electrician to come in because we have missing ground faults. Oh, arc faults. Missing arc faults. And there's no labeling. And there's missing, well, it's right there. But there's no um, screws at the dead front cover. And there's two missing up there. So this, this dead front was barely on. There's all the electrical wires. I see the bonding wire, grounding wire going out, and the line coming in. I take the dead front cover off, uh, just a look inside. Um, and uh, you don't have to. You're not required to pull the dead front cover off. It's very dangerous. I recommend you not do it. But that's one of the pictures that I put in my inspection report. It's one of the things that distinguishes me. I go beyond the standards of practice in a consistent manner with all my clients. And I'm looking for really double taps and melted wires or arcing. That's really all I'm looking for. I could comment upon the, the, um, the double taps or the, the lugs at the top or extra things that are in the panel that shouldn't be. Um, this, I guess, a disconnected exterior wire going out, underground feeder. But again, I'm limiting my own inspection to what I, I feel comfortable with. I'm looking for water, uh, melted wires, and overfusing, where I have a common 20 amp on a 14 gauge breaker. And sometimes that doorbell thing is on the inside, it should be on the outside. And sometimes I see this. So I'll say, ah, have an electrician come in. I already know that I want an electrician to come because of my arc faults are missing. So anything after that is just gravy. And that's really how I handle home inspections. I'm looking for that one defect where I can recommend further evaluation by a professional. Foundation wall, remember the hairline crack we saw on the outside? Well, I'm, I'm gonna look for other cracks if I can. And then I am restricted in my inspection because we have insulation attached or squished up into the, the floor joists. So I really can't see anything. I see pressure treated wood, on top of the foundation, that's great. I'm looking for water penetration at the corners. I see the water valves going on the outside. Looking for the corners being wet, especially where that condensate drain line is, where the air conditioner line is. But it all looks great. And then, this is the fireplace. So, um, it's hard to see, but when you see a transition and piece of plywood above your head, um, there could be a fireplace underneath, so this is exactly what it was. So there's a, a bit of a foundation holding up the fireplace, and this is the, the area where the fireplace is in the living room. It looks great. Oh, carpeting. But I can pull it up, and there's a sump pump there. And it's dry. I see the two ends of some drainage pipes discharging in there. It's, it's a dry pump. Sometimes I'll take a measurement just to make sure that the floor joists are properly installed. And spaced. And then that's a garden tool that I use, a three tine hoe. Three tines, it's extendable to four feet. Uh, one tine I, I go straight, the other one's a little bit bent, and the other one's really hooked so that I can manipulate insulation and move things. Um, a lot of home inspectors don't touch insulation at all. Uh, you're not required to in the standards of practice, but I do because every time I do, I find stuff. So here is a patch underneath the slider door um, in the back, and um, it probably rotted out. They replaced the slider door and patched the rotted wood, 
and then put it back, and it, it looks okay. It's a really messed up piece of wood with some water stains, but structurally, it looks fine. Now I'm looking like crazy with my three-tine hoe. I'm moving everything. I'm looking over here, looking over there, and I find more. There's another area with even some uh, possible mold growth, right? So that was wet, could have damaged some wood, and it had mold growth on it. So that's kind of fun. There's uh, an old tool that I used to have, and they just don't make them anymore. This is an extendable pole with prongs, and it was a moisture meter that gave me an audible and a, a visual readout. I didn't care what the moisture content was. I just wanted to hear something. If it was wet, it went and it gave me a red light. And I was able to stick it in where I couldn't reach with my hand. I can't find it anymore. Um, what was it called? Hydro something. It's a great invention. And a three-time hoe, so I don't mind moving insulation and putting it right back. Speaking of insulation, the next thing I do is I go all the way up into the attic, and I tell my client I'll be down in about 10 minutes. And I try to walk the attic if I can. If it's dangerous for me to uh, walk the attic, I won't. But um, I kind of, I'm used to doing this, so I can walk right across on this one. Um, have you ever fallen through, have you been, have you been doing the home inspections yet? Anyone fall through a ceiling? Yeah, it's fun. It's, it's, yeah, it's a really pain in the butt. So I was doing a home inspection, and um, I was so interested in the radon fan that was in the attic, and I tried to get around it to really look, and I, my foot just slipped, and I went all the way down instantly. You go all the way through. Uh, it doesn't, it's not like, you just go boom, and my one leg went all the way through, and I'm like that, you know, and I can't believe it because a closing is in two days, and it's like a huge, big mansion. And the contractors, I'll never forget it, one contractor must have been in the bedroom below me, and he gets on the intercom system of the house, and he goes, hey, somebody just fell through the ceiling, you know? And it was me, so I can, uh, great. And I had to patch it all up and all that stuff. So the um, moral to the story is, if it's not safe, don't even attempt it. Don't even attempt to pull the dead front cover off, don't pull the, don't go on the roof, um, don't pull anything off of the furnace, um, if you don't want to pull the meter off of the house, you don't have to. Remember, the standards of practice is really for you to begin with. It's a foundation, and you can stick to it until you get more comfortable in exceeding it. You don't have to enter the attic space if it doesn't have a floor. Even if it does have a floor, and you don't think it's safe, you don't have to go. Lots of good insulation. Bathroom fan. All bathroom fans must exhaust outside. I don't care when the house was built. Nope, has to be outside, outside, outside the building envelope, outside the building itself. Um, I, I can't remember what the code says, but it's, um, it has to be exhausted to the ex outside, I think it says. Yeah, yep. So any way you can get there, um, and it should be insulated and air sealed and all that good stuff, and this is just dumping a lot of warm, um, moist uh, air into the attic space. And it's neat because um, if you take our energy courses, you'll understand that this black stuff on the fiber, yellow fiberglass is not mold, it's dirt. And that's watermark there, and that watermark there is condensation, right? So air um, leaks out of a home in various ways, and one of them is through um, exhaust fans. And so they need to be blasted outside. Otherwise, you start to get um, condensate problems, and it's an energy um, problem because this isn't insulated at all. And um, um, it's going to cause condensate problems, maybe moisture, mildew uh, problems on building components inside the attic. And to find air leaks, look for black stuff on insulation. Ever lift up insulation? You may in the future. Lift up bat insulation, and if you see black streaks, that's probably air leakage coming from the home because um, all homes have this effect of um, drafting air vertically out through the building, all commercial buildings and residential home buildings, just to have this natural draft called a Venturi effect. And air just leaks out of a home if it's not sealed. 
And so if you ever look at bat insulation and then you see black stuff, it's likely um, air um, drawing, um, coming through the, the, the ceiling or building components or, or stud walls or interior walls. Even, even um, the hood over your stove in all kitchens need to exhaust, uh, regardless of any kind of ventilation system that you have in the house. All bathrooms, dryers, and kitchens need to exhaust outside. And that has been a code uh, standard for a long time. No, yeah, I love them. I love them recirculating things. I always call them out. But if you buy one of those units, um, you could adjust it. You could pop the hole in the back of the uh, microwave unit and exhaust out the house, yeah. But I see a lot of new construction. It's just, right. Yep, I would love to be, I love it when I um, talk to a builder. Well, I just love going against the builder and telling them this needs to exhaust outside. And then they argue, rah, 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 rah. and then if they need the code, I can show them the code. But it's, again, local, local authority having jurisdiction. If the local township inspector says that's okay, then the builder goes for it, man. It just recirculates all of them, you know? But really, everything should be going outside. Um, Natchez.org forward slash articles is a great resource um, to find things like uh, do a search for exhaust. If I can spell. If I can spell. Uh, so there's a inspecting a bathroom exhaust. So we, we show you, you know, what it should look like mm -hmm. and no bends and condensation. There's the picture. It was such a good one. And um, so all of that information, see how long that article is? That's just about bathroom exhaust, and that's how important it is. And then there's kitchen exhaust and dryer exhaust and all that good stuff. So um, we have a huge library of inspection articles there that you can use. What time is it? 7.20. 7.20? Okay. So uh, taking pictures of you know, the structure, two by tens, they're great. 16 inch centers, a lot of ventilation, a lot of insulation. I don't see any roof leaks. Remember, we have uh, water entry points on the roof. I see the roofing nails coming through. I can see if there, um, uh, if there are a lot of roofing nails coming through. It could be a second layer of, of shingles. Um, there isn't. Uh, I see one stain mark. This looks like a hole, maybe, where the nail was. Yep, yep. So, yep. So what I do is um, I really don't talk out loud about watermarks until I confirm it with a moisture meter. So I, I'll probe it or I'll get a, um, a moisture meter in my hand and I'll touch it and then I can talk about it. Because um, if you get into infrared, infrared is an interesting kind of thing because it it's so exciting to see an image and it looks like a roof leak or a water leak. And if you start to talk before you confirm with your moisture meter, you get into trouble. So my recommendation is always, um, Try not to be too excited about finding defects until you, especially related to moisture, until you have a moisture meter, touch it and confirm or deny what you think it is. Here's the garage. Our garage um, has a lot of defects that are in here actually. So you should have um, a nice firewall. Like this is done well. There's probably some duct work there. It's framed out, covered with drywall. But here's where the garage Door openers go through the drywall and they just blew through it. They cut open it, they cut it open and didn't um, patch it up again. So if there's a fire, uh, it goes right th up through the firewall. There's that, and there's that. An old uh, spring coil, garage door openers. I open and close them, um, do a little pressure test, trip the sensors. Here's a dryer exhaust going through the wall and into the garage, um, and that's a fire breach. So um, fire will start, if it starts in the garage, will just melt the crap out of this real fast and go right into the house. And the, the whole idea of a firewall between the gra garage and the house is to give the fire department about a half an hour to get to the house before the fire um, spreads. So all this is a firewall breach. And um, I know code may be interpreted 
in different ways by different people, but if I see more than two steps, one step, two step, if I see more than two steps, I want a handrail. And I can tell that with a straight face to any code officer because I'm a home inspector, I'm not a code inspector. I know the code, but for safety, I can't imagine my 80-year-old, 83-year-old uh, father um, doing that well without a handrail. It's also a requirement for FHA Yep, there you go. Yep. So, requirement for FHA loan is to have three or more steps that's got a handrail. Yep. Uh, it turns out that it didn't feel right, too. So um, the top step is actually one inch higher um, than the other steps. And there's that um, hairline crack that I found on the outside, and it's on the inside. I'm not really concerned about it. And you want the garage floor to be sloped away or a drain. All garage receptacles, all garage receptacles are GFCI protected. I have two garage door openers. Uh, they worked. They're functional. No big deal. I don't have any problems with the garage. Um, laundry. So this must be right up against the garage wall. I run water at all the uh, fixtures, sinks, toilets, flush in the toilets, tubs, showers. I try to run everything in the same bathroom um, all at once to see what happens. Whoops. There's that dryer exhaust. No GFCI protection. There should be. Um, this was okay back then when I inspected it, but you want four-prong dryer receptacles. Um, there's, uh, you know, these are the hot and cold with a valve in the drain. That's great. Uh, the dryer exhaust, that's all a fire hazard. What's wrong with that? Yep. Yeah, it's really, S-traps are all throughout this home. It's kind of fun. Uh, Natchee.org slash gallery is a really good resource. Um, because you want your inspection report to be filled with illustrations um, that look good. So if you go trap, you can do um, P-trap versus S-trap. And you can download that illustration um, and stick it in your inspection report. And all these illustrations, we have, I don't know, thousands of them, um, are free to members. And you can download them like that, or you can click this and download it in high resolution, and it comes out. Huge. I wish I had those illustrations when uh, I was doing inspection reports. Bathroom, I don't know where the bathroom goes. Um, do you remember the exterior? I just remember the dryer exhaust. I don't remember any other hood. So this bathroom, I bet, is exhausting into the joist bay. Flush the toilets, run the water at the sinks. Um, I use the side of my leg to push the the toilet to see if it's uh, secured down on the floor, see if I can get that wax seal to move, um, see if I can get the toilet to leak. That's a great day when I get a toilet to leak. It's, it's really stinky. I just love it. Fireplace. Um, not much to do with the fireplace. Um, there's some clearance things I, I want to pay attention to, but really I'm concerned about the interior. There's a hairline crack on this factory built fireplace. Um, and. Uh, it's just hairline. If it opens up anymore, I'm going to be concerned. Um, factory built fireplaces, that the, if, you know, if you've ever replaced them or broken them, they're about an inch thick and there's mesh in the middle of them. If you see mesh, um, that's a bad thing because that's not holding heat anymore um, in the fireplace. So it's a factory built fireplace is made out of things that can deteriorate. Masonry fireplaces kind of like are, last longer. And so I try to take a picture of just about everything. You're required to open up the damper and close the damper. And if I see um, soot or creosote, creosote would be black shiny. Um, soot is kind of like, like that, um, gray stuff. Um, I'm calling it, uh, calling it out to be cleaned. Now I'm on the interior. I did all the hard systems. I did the attic. Oh, to get into the attic, I, I use my um, picnic blanket. So I have a picnic blanket. It's checkered, red and white checkers. I put my pic picnic blanket down, and I set up my ladder, and I go up in. And everyone thinks that's fantastic. Just those little things that I have to do to beat Richard. And now I'm at windows and doors and interior, and this is really boring. I'm blowing through it as fast as I can. I'm looking for any kind of cracks or water penetration, cracked windows, fogged windows, uh, lights that don't turn on. Um, 
it's all representative. So I'm not testing every device, every wall receptacle. I only do once or um, I only do one every room about open and close a window and door, trying to find something wrong. Uh, I, try to, I try to test it. I try to take the light out if I could reach it and stick my tester in there and do the switch, take my tester in there, do the switch, take my, you know, and if I can't get something powered on, maybe I'll comment upon it. But, you know, back then, you know, light bulbs rattled when they blew out. So when you took the light out, it was probably a good indication. Now, you know, you have LEDs and things like that. Smoke detectors should have battery backups, um, and smoke detectors should test functional, and um, I don't spray any smoke into them. I did that once, and the, f the actual fire department came because I was spraying something wrong, so I, I don't do the cans anymore. I just push the button. Uh, I, I'll take the cover off. I'll, I'll pull uh, one smoke detector in the house off, and I want it hardwired with battery backup, and I'll put it back in. Um, that one I can tell. There's no battery backup because I don't have any battery uh, feature. Huh? No battery right. That's right. So I know it's hardwired only, so I'm going to call that out. And any smoke detector that's yellow, I'm going to call that out. Any smoke detector I think is 10 years old, I'm going to call that out. Yeah, it's aged. Yep. You, you're, uh, you're doing that with any age home as well? Like, FHA homes? No, just any age home. Any age home, right. Uh, regardless of the home. It could be an um, 1850 vi uh, Victorian home, right? Uh, if if it, I want smoke detectors where they're supposed to be today, you know? Um, yep. So there's... A lot of debate about that, but the safest route is to um, inspect the home regardless of the age. Um, when you say something like, um, like uh, let's say there's, um, at, at the time that when the house was built, um, a child's head could stick through the railing. And that was to code back then, right? What if a child's head gets stuck in the railing after you inspect it, right? So you want to inspect the home uh, according, regardless of age, and according to the most recent um, code, really. Because code is developed and updated, uh, especially the fire code, um, especially when someone gets hurt, unfortunately. When someone gets hurt, code changes. And firemen are, you know, we have really good fire codes. What's that? Yeah, yep. Uh, run all the fixtures. You know, I'm touching everything. I don't know. I just like to, you know, show that I'm using every, every uh, feature of the shower and tub. And then I like to push and pull. I like to pull, especially on the, um, the um, um, no, the railing, any kind of bars, any kind of bars. In, yeah, because I'm supposed to lean on it, right? Someone with a diff, uh, challenge supposed to rely on that thing. Well, I'm going to rely on it, right? And I'm going to push it. Um, you know, I've, I've damaged things in the past. What's that? Yeah, yep. And uh, careful, it could just be gunk, right? Um, so that's why I like to, did I see a, me pounding on it? Did I pound? Yeah, well, I must have, because that's what I do. I like to pound on the tiles. Um, I've repaired many tile walls the grout and all that stuff, and the backing board. It's just not fun. The soap dishes are a lot of fun. Sometimes they actually pop off. Um, the plastic surrounds are a lot of fun because the, the bar um, can turn, and then it, the glue breaks, and then you can do that with it, and then it just, you know, the leaks. It sounds like I'm damaging homes, but, you know, a bar inside a shower can really be relied upon, and if, it, if it's not stable, um, I would like to find that out. I don't have to, but if I find out that it's not reliable, I feel good. Um, this has had problems in the past because of watermarks, and it's a P-trap. I don't know what the match matches are from. It's a vacant home. Well, that's one way, yeah, if you don't have uh, bathroom spray, as you know. <laughs> um, but 
um, sometimes things like this make sense. Like sometimes you'll have um, paint um, in a bathroom cabinet. Like what's paint doing there? Or silicone. Or um, maybe, you know, uh, you should know a little bit about uh, grow houses and meth houses too. Um, uh, there are signs um, that can warn you that the place is not just a, a home, but it, maybe it's a factory. Around here? Oh, yeah. What, you should know what a grow house looks like, though. Um, you know, if you see, like, in the attic, like, you see a lot of electrical wires and hooks and things like that, you know, you may want to comment upon it. I love these, where um, it's a shower stall with a plastic um, base. I like to walk around the base and li listen for cracks because um, sometimes you don't... Um, get the installer to do it correctly. Sometimes they'll just foam it up. Um, and so over the years, uh, it cracks. And then the bottom corners are really fun to pound. And then I uh, direct the shower head into the bottom corners and see if I, with hot water and see if I can get at the leak on the outside. Sounds like I try to beat things up, but you know, I want to know if, if the shower is unreliable or not. This is a, a Whirlpool tub. Um, the motor should be within reach, um, GFCI protected, dedicated line. So I fill it up, and I'm looking for water leaks. I fill it up, not to break it, but to test it. Uh, there must have been a chip, yeah. So I'm looking really small, I'm looking at really small things. I'll put that in, in the report as a cosmetic issue. Cosmetic is a, a blemish that doesn't have to be even paid attention to. And then I turned it on and I take pictures of the bubbles. So the tub makes bubbles. I actually say that in the report. Um, a kid's head can fall through. Because when this house was built, it was built to code. But now, code has changed because children have gotten hurt. So that's a good reason to inspect a home regardless of the age of the home or when it was built. And if it was built to code back then, it doesn't matter. So there's the other vantage point that I got with the roof to see the skylights. And more doors, more boring stuff, wall receptacles, windows. This only takes me several minutes, the interior. Then I get to the, my last place where I have some of my um, documents and I'll set up my computer here and uh, I'll turn on the, the dishwasher spray, the garbage disposal, P-trap, GFCI works, testing GFCIs, that one doesn't. Dishwasher's empty, I'll run it and see if the seal um, is cracked. It looks like it's a relatively new dishwasher and stove and oven, and I'll, I'll touch or, or you know, make sure that the, the heating elements turn on. Um, one rule was um, you never leave uh, the oven. So you turn on the oven and you hold on the oven door handle and you're not allowed to leave um, because a lot of my inspectors would just love to leave and continue the kitchen inspection and then forget that the oven is on at 450 degrees. Microwave, uh, if vent, vents into the interior, should vent outside. Uh, microwave leak detector, um, old version. There's a newer version of our little detectors. And this is just the shock and awe kind of thing. Um, ideally, my client would be behind me and I turn on the microwave oven and it lights up if it senses microwaves. Uh, that's my FLIR B-CAM SD. I bought it for $5,000 when it first came out. Put it on a credit card. Didn't tell my wife because I knew that uh, I could sell, upsell our services. So I went from 329 to 369 because I used infrared and I had to I had to allow my clients to pay for my new infrared camera. You know, I don't pay for anything. I increase my fee for my home inspection according to what I need to get back in order to pay for that tool. I don't, um, I don't buy these for $2.70. Um, I, I used to hand these out with someone else's and then I wrote my own. So um, I just increased my fee by five bucks allow my own clients to pay for their own home maintenance book and a cup of coffee for me. So, um, yeah, nothing should cost you any money. Um, oh, and 
These are all like marketing ideas and things that come from our marketing department, like this one. I wish I had this when I was in the home inspector. So this room has been inspected and it's monster free. So if I have kids on a Saturday inspection following me around on the interior, I go a little bit slower for their bedroom. And I put this and I tell them what I checked. I checked under the bed, in the closet, under the rug, behind the curtains, and I, I put this on their door. Yeah. That's right. There's probably fine print somewhere. No, no, I'm not concerned about that. Um, I think that's the heat pump. So I turn on the air conditioner and that's just a warm unit. Um, there's like no difference in temperature. So it's like five degree difference. So I like to use my infrared camera where I know I'm gonna see something. Um, so this is a in, uninsulated attic access um, above the garage. So that's not insulated and I can't remove that panel because it's been um, sealed and screwed in. But I'll put it in the report as it's not insulated because my infrared tells me. And attic access, um, that's not insulated or sealed. I went through it um, during the inspection to get into the attic and I just wanna take a picture of that because it's kinda neat. Um, I know it's not insulated, but this is kind of like marketing so I actually put that in the report, or maybe the infrared picture itself. And this um, is not insulated as well, and I, it, it wasn't sealed with silicone, so I just took the screws out, and the drywall wasn't cut open. So the attic access is covered by drywall. They didn't uh, leave it open. So there's the access panel, but there's drywall behind it. And this is the shot of the garage. Um, I don't know why they insulated the garage, but they left insulation out. So I think over here, there must have been the orientation of the um, house is a little difficult. Um, this is the master bedroom closet area up here. But this part is not insulated, so I thought that was kind of neat to show that that part is not finished, but over here is, and that's the closet area. And here's the report. Before we go over the report, any questions? Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I, I turn it on. Short cycle, short cycle. I just let it run. Usually, um, I don't wait for it to cycle through. I'm usually out of the house by the time it does. But I'm looking for, vacant homes tend to have leaky dishwashers. Occupied homes, they usually don't have dishes in it with a leaky dishwasher. They, you know, they don't live with leaky dishwashers. That's generally your flow and the kitchen's the last. Last thing, because that's where the money is. That's where I turn my computer and play the video. And that's, and that's where I get paid. Right, I don't turn on the clothes washer and dryer. Do not. Nope. That's right, that's right. I just look for the water supply hoses, the electrical connection, and the dryer exhaust. You know, I look at those. Water supply hoses, braided stainless steel pressure tested hoses. I look at the discharge also, the, t the yep. And then um, the um, electrical hookups, what, how are they plugged in? And maybe there's an extension cord or something dumb. And then the dryer exhaust is always fun. Yeah. So knowing that if you, let's say when you're in the attic and you see a possible stain that could be moisture. Yeah. Yep. To test it, what if it happens? So, how would you go about it if you could see it and you're like, well, I don't know, but you can't get to it to test it? Yeah, then I, I'm going to um, say that I observe indications of a prior water leak at the ceiling. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll report what I observe. Okay. I report, I, I observe this, and I'm going to report upon it. Or you could say indications of. You know. And if you can use your moisture meter and it's dry, I'd still report it. You know, I'd say moisture meter comes up negative. That shows, appears to be yeah. Previous. previous. Of yeah, in a two-story home, 
I love going down on the first floor after doing the second floor, coming out of the attic, doing the second floor, running water, and then coming down on the first floor and looking up underneath the bathrooms, if I can remember where they were, right? That's where I want to be. I want to be under there because that's where my, in my own home, that's where my leak is or was, you know, right underneath that bathroom. And sometimes you could get a light, a really high powerful light and shine it along the ceiling. And um, if it's been leaking or patched before, you'll see a sag or some weird patch. Like it looks good when the sun is reflecting off the drywall and everything, it looks like all flat. But when you do one of those things with your flashlight and pass on the ceiling, you can see the imperfections in the drywall, especially where there's been a patch. It's kind of neat. So this is the inspection report. And um, I put in this, what really matters in a home inspection. I'm trying to uh, set the expectation of my client and tell them that there are really just four things that they have to pay attention to. The major things, an example would be a significant structural fa failure. Things that may lead to major defects, like a small water leak that may advance into something major. <laughs> things that may hinder your ability to finance, occupy, or insure the home which is like termite infestation, and safety hazards, such as GFCIs, a lack of GF GFCIs. That, um, par th that page of information there was in every home inspection, um, and uh, it helped me explain what I'm really doing. I'm only really looking at the thing that, stuff that really matters. Real estate agents love that too. Yeah, I, oh, I always did. Anything that damages wood, fungus, carpenter ants, carpenter bees, termites, anything, water, anything that damages wood. It's called wood destroying water, wood destroying bees, wood destroying ants, wood destroying termites. It's all anything that destroys wood, even human beings. I'm looking for big cuts in floor joists, cuts, notches, board holes. Right? Those three things. That's Anything that damages right. wood. I am. I'm an internationally certified wood destroying organism oh. inspector. <laughs> in my state, though, in all states, they license pesticide applicators. Pesticide applicators do not like home inspectors going where they're not supposed to go, right? We're not supposed to be doing their job because they want the $75. Well, I used to do it. And I didn't call it a, a WDO inspection. I used to call it, um, I didn't use the NPA, NPMA 33 form. I used my own form, right? And I just looked for bugs that ate wood or damaged wood. And I often found it. And then I referred my client to a licensed pesticide applicator to come in and further evaluate. So if I found termites, mud tubes, Pennsylvania, a lot of mud tubes, or uh, carpenter bees in the summer, you can actually watch them. Carpenter bees, they drill half inch holes, they go in about an inch and turn exactly 90 degrees and put their babies in there. They're really easy to find because they dump a lot of sawdust and frass on the, on the ground. I, I would report that, I put it right in my report. Th that's damaging wood, that little bug. Huh? You would do that even if you weren't, didn't have the WDO. Right, yeah, I was just a nut. Yep, if I saw termites, I am going to report it. I'll call it indications of termites, right? And, may, and I would, if it was beetles, I wasn't very good at beetles. Um, you know, there's a ton of different kinds of beetles. So I would not identify the particular insect, but I would certainly say bug. So you use the chart extra on your session for that? Yeah, yep. Because Pennsylvania at the time didn't regulate it. I don't know if they actually regulate it now. But if you're going to spray pesticide and call yourself a licensed pesticide applicator, that's all regulated. But my, my um, inspection, my visual inspection of homes was not essentially regulated. I could, I could look at things like that. I could inspect pools if I wanted to. Yeah, I could be hired separately for this, it was 75 bucks for this WDO inspection. Or if I wasn't hired to do a WDO inspection for $75, I would inspect the home as if I was looking for termites, right?
because I don't want that structural defect to be missed by me. It's like, uh, it's like I, don't want, I don't want that to be, I don't, want to, I don't want to make that mistake. It's like I felt like I would make a mistake. If I heard later on somebody found termites at the house that I inspected and performed a home inspection on, why didn't I see it? Right? I want to be as good as any licensed pesticide applicator who's doing an inspection. Right? Who has a conflict of interest, anyways? I mean, that was my whole big argument that these pe licensed pesticide applicators would do a termite inspection and they'd drive up in a tank filled with pesticide. Right? I mean, there, there's a conflict of interest there. And they're, of course, they're going to find something, some, some kind of WDO problem. Me, I have no pesticide to sell. So I was really like the third party neutral. And if I found a, a bug that looked like it was damaging wood, I'd report it in my home inspection report. And if I was hired to do something else, I'd put it in that report too. You know? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I would have loved to make that money. That, that sounds good. That sounds about right. You know? So um, I used to package my services. So I just, I had felt terrible if I only did a home inspection. So um, I would usually do a home inspection, a termite, and a radon. And that turned out to be about um, 537. I, th I, I remember it's 537. And if I could do two of those a day, then I'm making a thousand bucks a day. And I come home with a thousand bucks every day, times 300 days. It's a lot of money. So that was my goal for all my inspectors, right? Um, but I also was certified in everything. I was a uh, EPA lead hazard risk assessor. That was a lot of money. For 500 bucks, I got baby wipes and I wiped windows and floors and sent it in to a uh, lab. You know, that was great money. In fact, I highly recommend it. Lead hazard risk assessor, you have to take a five-day class. But man, you, your credibility just goes through the roof. I'd beat Richard in the marketplace, right? Because you don't want to be a lead hazard risk assessor, but I do. Just using you, because you're, you're sitting right next to me, so I'm going to pick on you. Um, so my services that I provided also gave me uh, a competitive advantage because that differentiated me from all the rest. When I go into a home doing a home inspection, I often said, while I'm here, you know, while I'm here, do you know I do radon tests? Second leading cause in lung cancer. Uh, uh, you think we should, hon? Yeah, mm, he's right, he's here. He said he's got a test thing, yeah, and so I do it, right? So here's my um, inspection report. Uh, some blah, blah, blah that, you know, I, I'm not, um, I can't find all the defects. I actually say that in a lot of places in the report. Like, uh, where is it? We are not certified chimney professionals. Only a level two can determine the condition of the flu. So if I happen to look at the flu, which I often do if I'm on top of the roof and I look down at a fireplace, I'll take a picture of the flu. I'm not required by the standards of practice, but if my head is there and my eyes are there, I might as well take a look at it and even take a picture of it. Oftentimes I'll see a hole in the terracotta clay tile flu, but I'll disclaim it in my re inspection report. So remember all this, the, the cap and the flashing and the mesh and the kickout flashing, and here's the fireplace. So I took pictures um, that I took during the inspection, later on in the inspection, and I incorporate it into this first section with the chimney. So my first section is the chimney that's part of the roof. So here comes my roof section. And let's see, oh, we are not professional roofers. Feel free to hire one before closing. Um, we do our best to inspect the roof system. We inspect the roof covering, drainage systems, blah, blah, blah. Um, we're not required to inspect this, this, and that. This is not an exhaustive, exhaustive inspection of every inspection, installation detail of the roof system according to the blah, 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 blah. It's virtually impossible to detect a leak except as it is occurring, you know. So I tried to make plain language that um, it's impossible. W roofs leak. You know, all roofs leak. Even a roof that appears to be in good condition may leak under cer certain, circumst certain circumstances. We will not take responsibility for a roof leak that happens in the future. 
and I've, I've um, gotten complaints on the phone and I've read that sentence to them and sometimes it goes away and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, anything I recommend is red. Yeah, where is it? So it's, is it here? Chimney flashings, correction, and further questions. Well, it's, it, it, it goes there to the open gap, and then it talks about the kick out flashing. So it's red, you know, is here. And it, it, I really nailed it hard. You know, correction by a professional roofer is recommended. Yeah, that's, that's what yeah. So legally, I felt it was best to not use like green and blue and uh, black. Anything that I want fixed or monitored even, because there could be a problem in the future, I want it to be red. So no one's going to pull me into court and say, well, why is the defect recommend, recommendation green, right? That seems kind of weird. I want everything red. So every, every call to action is in red and italicized, bolded, and all caps. I want that to pop. I'm not pulling any punches. If I have something that needs to be monitored, I'm going to make it red, right? If I have something that needs to be corrected and further evaluated, it's red in caps because I want people to see it. I'm not trying to hide a defect so that uh, this real estate agent can use me again. Screw it. Um, remember Porter Valley. Porter Valley uh, is still around, I think, but um, uh, you know, I would, I would suggest that there are other softwares out there that are a lot better. So we've seen all this, like the defects of the roof and the nails. The exterior, that's the third section of my you know, improvement. There's large bulge in the vinyl siding. And there's loose capping falling off the house. Um, the exterior driveway, remember the, the front door and patio. Ex exterior water faucets, they're not frost proof. Uh, the vent hood is no good. So there, oh, there's the retaining wall, remember that? And there's the heat pump. Some basic stuff that uh, shows up in every inspection report is kind of like here. And then there's, you know, my narratives that I choose to put in the inspection report. They're all written. And these are on default that they always show up. And the rest of it, I actually have to tap what I want to say. So on this one, this is a good comment. It's level. But my other comments would be in red and it would be, it's off level, right, as an example. Lots of pictures. That's what distinguished, distinguished me from my competition. I used to put in a lot of pictures and a lot of pages. I don't know how long this report is, but we're on page 19 at the heat pump. And you printed this out at the time. Yeah, I used to, yeah, yep. I think clients are expecting it to be emailed or a downloadable report, and they want to take action on the summary. So I've heard summaries are still important. Want to take action on the summary. Gotcha. The real estate agent wants to know, okay, what do we really got to do? And that's the summary report, because they don't have time to read a 50-page inspection report like mine. I would just do an email. Like, if you use a, a business system like ISN, it's almost automatic. A software system, it's like a, a, you give your client an email with the username and password, and they log in, and they download your report when it's available. It's kind of fun because you get to see when they actually read the report and all that other good stuff. Um, you, they can't get to it until they pay you. You know, it's kind of neat. You hold off on the product until your, your agreement is signed and you get paid. I rarely did. I rarely did. And it was part of my pitch that you only pay me after I'm done. Right? I never said, if you don't like it, you don't have to pay me. Um, yeah, yeah. Nowadays, there are systems in place where, that make your life easy. Um, so have systems in place like that. 
like software, um, especially report software, and maybe email systems that uh, allow uh, you to free up your time. I mean, you can almost do this all on your own, but an office manager eventually would be really good, a human being. Not necessarily a call center, because they're not invested, but someone that you employ. And so um, what I did was I hired Amy, um, my first office manager, and I got her uh, um, certified to do radon tests. So while um, she made phone calls in the morning, she went out and then picked up or placed radon tests and came back to the office and finished up her work. So she was actually making money um, and scheduling her local radon um, placement. So when I would go to a, a home inspection, my radon tests were already placed by Amy. That was great, you know. Nah, I just never did that. Yep. 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 Yeah, and I bet they're giddy happy too, because they're willing to take that risk. So in business, um, if the um, cost of managing risk is less than the profit, then go for it, right? So they don't mind waiting 45 days, they make a little bit of extra money for that weight, that's great, you know? They, they are into that. I like to just be paid, and so I just stuck with that. You know, I wanna be paid at the end of the inspection. It was kind of a, an easy brand. Like, oh yeah, we pay him at the end of the inspection. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah. And sometimes that's me. Like I'll inspect a home, and if something falls through, the seller doesn't come around, or something like that. Or maybe the inspection uh, revealed something that the seller was adamantly opposed to. Like we're not going to fix anything. Um, and an opportunity comes by with a new home. Yeah, I'll inspect that second home for that same client at a discount. I felt like I, I, I would give them a discount, you know, because I'm going to inspect the same home, uh, another home for my same client, you know. Yeah, I'll give them a discount. But then, after you're in the business for a long time, not only do you have repeat customers, but you have repeat homes. So I'll inspect it, I'll go like, it feels like deja vu, like I've been here before. You know, like, like, yeah, five years ago, you were here, you know, inspecting the home. Same yeah, same, yeah, same defects. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I and mean, the EPA recommends something about testing your system, too, um, every once in a while. Um, it should all work. So we have a radon system in here that's all messed up, and we have an inspection checklist for how to inspect a radon system. And so you could use that in your template, right? If you come across, um, you're doing a home inspection, you come across a radon system, you're like, oh, you know, you can pull up that tab for the inspection checklist for a radon system and visually inspect it even if you're not testing the radon level in the home, you can inspect the heck out of that system. And if it was built to code back then, it's probably wrong now, because the EPA upgraded their standards a little bit. If, if you're inspecting something, you get stuff, you're not quite sure terminology or if something's right or wrong, yep. you can probably slip on like gachi.org articles and then search for something on that and find You, you could, you yep. I always just said, I don't know. Like, if they ask me a question, if you ask me a question now, I don't know, I'm going to tell you I don't know. But I, I'll, I'll find out tomorrow. So um, I think that's maybe a hesitation with a lot of inspectors. They want to be the experts, and you don't have to be. So if you're looking at something, like, you don't know what it is, and you're asked, what is that? And then, I don't know. But I'm going to take a picture of it, and I'm going to look it up tonight. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. And then you go on your way, you know? So don't, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. I don't know what that is, but I've got a lot of friends who may, so I'm going to take a couple pictures and I'm going to find out tonight. Um, so a lot of people have, like, you could argue, don't put any prices on your website and force them to call you, but I hated that because I had to do sales then, or my office manager had to do sales and convince them that we were worth the amount of money. I liked my prices to be known all over the place so that when that phone rang, um, I knew that it was profit. 
You know, and I price, do you know how to price your services? Oh. Nope, it's math. So it, it includes your desired salary, your overhead, and your desired profit divided by how much you want to work. And that's how much you charge. And it's all math, and it's in chapter 11 of our home inspection business course. And we provide an example of how to price your services. It's not based upon feeling, not based upon really market, and not based upon what Richard is doing. It's based upon math, your own math. So that when you know the phone is ringing and you pick it up, you've already figured out that this is profit. And you don't have to figure out like, am I gonna make money on this job or not? You know it's, if the phone rings, it's money. Because you've already done the math. That's the hard part. What time is it? Yeah, so let's, you know, there's the inspection report. I can give this to you um, to review. I have a ton of sample inspection reports online if you want to look through them. Oh, and uh, here's a report conclusion, which is really cool. Um, there's a pre-closing walkthrough. So for every home inspection, there was an opportunity to um, walk through the home just before closing or on the day of closing, usually in the morning, I can walk through because some defects aren't found during the inspection, especially if it's an occupied home and then vacant on closing day. It's a great, great time to run water and look around for a little bit. 15 minute inspection, I'll do that for a few bucks. And then I leave a, um, a letter to the seller on their kitchen table about what I just did in their home, which was I turned everything on, I moved a lot of stuff, I tried to put it back, I was clean, I wear clean indoor shoes. We wore indoor shoes only. Uh, outdoor shoes are for outdoors. And then we brought our tools bag and took our shoes and put indoor only shoes, you know? Um, and we moved everything, we tried to put it all back. You may wanna um, take a look at these few things and if you have any suggestions, give me a call back. And that's on every um, kitchen table. Um, it's in every inspection report because they're it could be printed out and then I just leave it on the counter. Yeah, just email me, ben at internet.org, and I can tell you where to find all these sample reports. Yep, yep. You can email, yep, there's, there's letters like that. That's my actual personal one, and I think there's a, someone told me there's a spelling error in it. I often had a lot of spelling errors in my inspection reports because I would tweak them and edit them and improve them on site. That's actually so if you go to um, natchee.tv natchee and click the home inspection tab, um, you'll have sample reports available that uh, I used during other webinar classes. Um, this is a really great um, system, the online agreement system. You can find the agreement, that plain English agreement is there. And if you can't find anything else, or if you're looking for something, we try to put it all on one page. It's called slash everything. And that's for everything else. If you're looking for anything and everything, try that first. And then email me. Um, um, even uh, websites. So if you want to do your website next, um, I have resources where you could build your own inspection website. It looks really good, and it's absolutely free you have the skill set to do it. If you can write an inspection report, you can build a website. And when I say free, there's a place where you can build a really great website and it's hosted by them and it's free, zero. The most expensive business, commerce, shopping cart website, you're not gonna have a shopping cart, is like $17 a month, right? So you're probably, if you wanted additional features, it's a few dollars a month. But for free ones, they're great and if you can write an inspection report, which means add pages, then you can add pages to a website. If you can upload images to your inspection report, you can upload images to your website. If you can do video, video. If you can write text in your inspection report, you can write text in your website. It's the same thing. You have the same skill set. Don't feel obligated to hire HomeGage or Home Inspector Pro. Their sites, they're not the greatest. You can do much better because you're invested in it. They could care less. They're going to try to create a, a website for you as fast as possible, right, to reduce their man cost, uh, uh, um, worker cost, right? So you, just like how you uh, improve your inspection report every day, can improve your inspection website every day. So don't feel obligated anymore to hire somebody to do your website. 
with a click of a button in about a couple minutes, you can have a really nice website, actually. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're on Natchi TV, N-A-C-H-I dot TV, yep. You click the tab called Website, and I have some videos on how to, uh, especially like there's a feature where um, somebody visiting your website can um, text you, you know, and then you receive a text. Yeah, and now what the first thing you do is, um, hey, uh, could you give me your phone number? Oh, no, no, let's see, how does it work? They, they visit your site and they want, oh, it's a little dot, right. Would you like to chat with the home inspector? And so they say, yes, I want to chat with the home inspector. And to chat with you, um, they have to enter their phone number. And then you get a message with their phone number, and you click a button, and their phone rings, right? And you go, and they're like, hello? And like, hey, you're visiting my website. Well, yeah, I am. Who's this? I'm Big Ben Inspections. Oh, my gosh. So th it's the phone number that you want, so you can call them back and close that deal. Anything else? All right, it's a late night. You got one more day, right? It should be a nice, easy day tomorrow. Oh, Virginia, bye. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys.